Ayurveda really encourages us to grow our awareness of everything in life, every experience that we have, and to really know for our own selves what supports and nourishes us and what doesn't. We have a word in, in Ayurveda we call ahara, and ahara is a word that's translated to mean food, but it actually means nourishment, and it's everything. It's an evening like this. Is this nourishing to you? Is your family nourishing to you? Is your brother nourishing to you? Is a prank nourishing to you? Is the color green nourishing to you? What colors, what tastes, what smells, all the things that we can experience with our five senses. We want to become more and more aware of what nourishes us and more and more aware of what we say is the opposite of that. In Ayurveda, we call that a poison or a toxin. If it's not nourishing you, then it's diminishing you or depleting you. So if I ask this question, <laughs> what are the five senses? Let's just, I just want to get that kind of engagement going. So they are, I mentioned a couple of them. Sometimes. Sight, taste, taste. taste. smell, smell. Touch. touch, important one. We call that the Raj, the king of, of senses. And then there's one other. Hearing. We get to hear things, right? <clears throat> so again, what sounds are pleasant? We go to restaurants a lot and we're noticing that the sounds we hear in restaurants a lot don't feel conducive to a great conversation. They don't even feel conducive to good digestion. So a lot of what Ayurveda is really asking, what this book is asking, is to really pay attention to what's going to make you digest your food best, including the sounds that are around you, the emotion that you feel when you're eating, the smells and the tastes. A lot of people ask me questions like, what do I feed my kids? They just won't eat greens. And you know, it's about kids aren't supposed to necessarily eat greens. Grown-ups are supposed to eat greens. So this whole book is really about the science of what you basically already know if you're really paying attention. It's said to be the oldest comprehensive system of medicine. It's now being taught in medical schools in America. It's taught in first semester history class. They teach that medicine starts with Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. It comes out of the Himalayan region, comes out of the Himalayas where people had the great rivers and great rivers meant they had great fertile lands, and great fertile lands mean they had a lot of wealth. And because of that wealth, they had time on their hands. And because of that time on their hands, they were able to sit back and contemplate nature and reality and existence. And really through paying attention, <laughs> they were able to cognize this medicine and this medical system. Again, what I love so much about it is that it's knowable. And because it's knowable, it means it's accessible to us that as soon as I say, gosh, I have this imbalance, I'm feeling really spacey, I'm feeling really ungrounded, what do I need? I need the opposite. I need something that's going to be grounding. I need something that's going to be centering or calming, right? So it's really just, as I said, it's about this paying attention. Okay. So I've been studying Ayurveda for, for many, many years. I'm just finishing up my master's in it. As I said, I've been writing for a long time. And I thought I would just start with the intro to my book, which is really to give you a sense of why I love Ayurveda so much. So remember, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. I'm from the Midwest as well. I remember long summer nights when, as children, we would lay ourselves out on the grass and gaze up into the vast night sky. Do you remember that excitement and wonder? It was as if your whole body was listening while you felt the whole wor world glistening. Subsequently in my life, I found a science that articulates this experience. It's called Ayurveda, and it's a comprehensive system of healing and wellness that arises from the universal wisdom embodied in this quote from the ancient Sanskrit roots, Yata Pinda Tata Brahmande. And that Yata Pinde Tata Brahmande means that in the pin, in the tiniest thing, is the greatest thing. In the beginning is the all. In the, in the single cell is the cosmos and that every single one of us is a mirror of all the elements in all of existence. It's a really beautiful understanding that in the personal is the universal and in the one is the all. Ayurveda is a tangible reminder that you are an integral part of this natural world, alive with radiance and grace. In fact, you are a mirror of all that is mighty and majestic, and you are made of the very same power that ignites and sustains all existence. From the root word Ayur, meaning life, and Veda, meaning science, Ayurveda does not define a person by their illness. Instead, it views each individual as a vital expression of life with intelligence and regenerative powers that sometimes need support and nurturing. In this way, Ayurveda restores dignity to patients and humanity to medicine. 
Its service to the wider world is its simple, easy to adapt and intuitive systems for better living. And those joys start in the kitchen. According to the, one of the ancient texts, the Charaka Samhita, the distinction be between health and disease arises as a result of the difference between wholesome and un unwholesome diet. To me, cooking is where Ayurvedic wisdom comes home, where nature in her great generosity offers herself most fully to us, letting us touch, taste, smell, and behold her bounty while turning everyday meals into delights of nourishing, balance, and healing. Yeah, so that was my inspiration for the book. <laughs> Good. So I had a couple of questions and I wanted to um, ask you. This is a book about food and this is a book that organizes 108 recipes into breakfast, lunch, and dinner as well as treats and, and snacks. And then it also organizes within each chapter of each meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, it organizes it by seasons. So at the beginning of the chapter you're going to have winter recipes, then spring recipes, summer recipes, and autumn recipes. So it's pretty easy, I hope it's easy to use and easy to access. If I mention to you that we have seasonal recipes, why do you think that is? What does that mean? To take advantage of fresh food. To take advantage of fresh food, which we could do at the grocery store at Vons where we have food from every season, all year round. So work on circadian rhythms, so our bodies are, have different rhythms and different seasons. Yeah. So absolutely right. We want fresh food because fresh food is what feeds us. It's got energy to it and it's pranic. And this idea of circadian rhythms, Ayurveda is now being called a circadian medicine. It's basically really about the rhythms of the universe, what causes the seasons. You know, Ayurveda is this reminder that you are nature. So that you're, everything is great and beautiful as nature itself. You, know, you think about your most beautiful favorite place in nature. You're that. <laughs> you and you know uh, you see how gosh it's springtime now and Coronado is so beautiful this time of year because everything's blossoming right now and when I see that I'm reminded that we are made of the same thing we have the same regenerative powers within us that means we have the power to heal ourselves it's pretty extraordinary because we've been doing it all of our lives and we've been doing it without thinking but think about it you cut something you break a bone it heals itself and you don't have to get a book out of the library go to the bookstore to figure out how am I going to heal that cut it knows how to do it itself and Ayurveda is really a system, a comprehensive system, that is basically has pulled that wisdom out of ourselves and written it down in books. And by this idea of the circadian medicine, what do we mean? Where do the seasons come from? The earth is doing this. Yeah. So night and day happen because the earth spins, right? And then the earth spins around the sun, and that gives us seasons. So when we live seasonally, when we align our lives to the rhythms of nature, we're actually aligning our lives to the solar system and to the Earth's movements. One of my teachers once said, in a world that is infinitely dynamic and ceaselessly spinning, where's the pause button? You know, sometimes you just feel like you just want to say, stop, <laughs> it's going too fast. There's no such thing. The best we can ever do is to move in rhythm to align with nature's movements, to, to align with these circadian rhythms, and then we get a feeling of ease and pause and wellness and vibrancy. And that's really what this is about. It's about living seasonally, about cooking seasonally. It's about the foods that are not flown in from Colombia or flown in from somewhere else because it's summer there and it's winter here, but the foods that were actually picked by somebody who's picked it thoughtfully. It was grown <laughs> thoughtfully and mindfully, and it was brought to you thoughtfully and mindfully and carefully. So the foods that are locally grown are going to be the seasonal foods. They're going to be best able to support you with not just their prana, we call it, their energy, but also with their intelligence and their support. Hi, nice to see you. Do we have an extra chair? Do you want to come sit on the floor? Are you sitting on the floor these days? No, probably not. Um, is there one more chair? Here's a chair. Sure. And I've got a present for you. <laughs> Somebody else came in and did a present. Okay, good. Last one. You didn't get one? Well, good. There's two left. You didn't get one? I thought I gave you one. Sorry about that. And there's the last one. Okay. So, um, now that it's springtime, for instance, 
it's not just that we want the energy of spring foods, it's that we want the intelligence of spring foods. Meaning, what is the spring season like versus what the autumn season was like? What do you notice you feel in spring? This is especially true for those of you who live in the northern part of America. Well, you guys kind of live in the north, right? In the, in the winter you're here? Okay. But those of you who have lived a winter in Minneapolis or Portland or Chicago or Boston, what do you start to feel like in March? Tired of the snow, right? Tired of this, ugh. You're kind of wearing heavy clothes. You're kind of stuck inside. I remember by March it was like not another snowstorm, right? <laughs> You're feeling tired time of... Time to go to Coronado. <laughs> yeah, time to go to <laughs> Right, because what do we get in Coronado? Sun. Sun. We get heat. We get warmth. So what we're looking for in the spring is we want more heat, we want more warmth, and we want to lighten up. We want to release the heaviness and stagnation of winter. What are the foods that are going to help us do that? The foods that are going to help us do that, I always like to say Mother Nature and the infinite wisdom of nature, offers us the food that will balance us in these seasons. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Did you want me to sign your book for your brother? Yeah. We didn't want to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, I'll sign it. I'd be happy to sign it. Please. Anyone else, if you have to go, please just hand me your book. Um, so I was just saying the foods that come up in the spring, maybe you have an example of your favorite food that comes up in the spring, are the just foods that balance. Really quickly. Yeah. My, my finger too. What's his name? Paul. Okay. So while I write this... Sorry, Paolo. P -A -O -L -O. Paolo. P-A-O-L-O. Okay. P-A-O. Okay. And uh, what's the joke? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hope you'll like the new place. What are your favorite spring foods? My favorite spring foods? Yeah. Asparagus. <coughs> Great. What about you, honey? Favorite spring food, honey? Peas are fresh in the springtime, and you can actually eat them right out of the garden, right? Thank you, so much. Thank you guys Sorry so much. Bless yeah. you. It's thank nice to meet you. Asparagus is a green shoot, right? And asparagus is a perfect example. Why? Because asparagus is astringent and it's bitter. And the taste of astringent and bitter are purifying, detoxifying, lightening us up. The other foods that we like to eat maybe are kale or arugula, watercress. Watercress has a lot of pungency to it, so it's got the heat and the warmth that's going to help burn away the heaviness. What have I mentioned? I've basically mentioned greens. Greens are a spring food. And the spring greens are different from the summer greens. Have you ever noticed that? Summer greens are cooling, spring greens are heating. Spring greens are very light and pr very astringent and very bitter. Astringent is the dry taste on your tongue. Persimmon before it's really ripe, right? A banana peel, that's the astringent. Tea when you leave it in a long time, right? Bitter, bitter is the taste that kids don't like. It takes growing up. As we grow, we grow a, a taste for bitter. Why? Because bitter is the most detoxifying. Our natural medicines are almost all bitter tastes. Everybody talks about turmeric now. Turmeric comes out of the Ayurvedic tradition. Turmeric is astringent, but mainly it's bitter. And so by being astringent and bitter, it's very detoxifying. It's very cleansing. It's very clearing. And what are we all wanting our turmeric for? We want it to you know, clear the blo bloodstream. We want it to clear the liver. We want it to clear and make us more agile, more, uh, more mobile. Right? It helps to reduce tumors. And that's its astringent and bitter taste. So there's Hi, how are you, Adele? Good to see you. Thank you for coming. So there are basically five elements, which are, we didn't mention, earth, water, fire. I'll give you those three clues. And then what else? Air. Air. <laughs> and air moves through? Wind. Space. Space. <laughs> okay, so there's five elements. And we are all, because we're all nature, we're made up of those five elements. That's basically the medicine. And when one goes out of balance, we need to balance them with the other things. Too much air, too much wind. We need water and earth that are grounding. We need fire or, or something that's going to warm because air is cold. Right? And the six tastes of nature, basically nature communicates to us through these six tastes. And she's communicating nourishment. She's communicating what is available to us to eat. It's amazing. Don't you, do you ever wonder, like, how did somebody know that you could eat a mango? Or how did somebody know that you could eat that asparagus? 
And how do they know this, not that? But each of these tastes is inviting us to nature's nourishment. And nature evolved, this is something I love, nature evolved so that you would find her delicious and attractive and that you would then be drawn to eat these foods that are going to most nourish you. And of the six tastes, and this is in the book, the taste that is the most nourishing is a sweet taste. And so we're designed to crave that because when we were nomadic and when you know, we were looking for food, we needed a lot of tonifying foods, things that would build us up. So it's in us to want to have the sweet taste. But we don't mean sweet processed sugar. We mean rice, wheat, meat, um, nuts, dairy, cheeses, uh, root vegetables, and fruit, of course. So we mean, you know, those are the tastes that are, sometimes they're bland even. The British, the old-fashioned British diet is a very sweet-based diet. Um, Okay, so sweet, salty, sour. Yeah. Sorry, I don't understand bland and sweet. Those things don't. Well, rice well. is kind of bland. Uh, boiled vegetables are kind of bland, okay. without any spice added, without anything added to them. That sort of thing can be bland. Okay. So I don't mean we don't mean sweet like sugary sweet. We mean not pungent okay. or spicy, not salty. You know, n not other other strong flavors. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, salty which is basically, you know, we have a lot of sweet in our meals and we have very little salt in our meals. But it's seaweed or it's actual salt, mineral salt. Sour is anything fermented, including yogurt and vinegars and fermented vegetables. And then there's pungent, astringent, and bitter. And the pungent, astringent, and bitter are the tastes we seek in the spring. Because pungent is spice and it heats us up and it b boosts our digestive fire. Astringent is like scrubs the inner body and it's toning, and then bitter, as I said, is detoxifying and pur purifying. So I gave everyone except Adela, I'll, have, I'll get, have one for you, but everybody got um, a spice blend, and this is a recipe that's in the book, and it's my spring spice blend. And one of the things about Ayurveda that can get complicated is that we end up, like my blog, I have recipes that are really long recipes, because it's like a <coughs> teaspoon of cinnamon and a tablespoon of ginger and this and that. And so instead of having so many things, what the, we did with the book is, if it's a spring recipe, you basically, if I, you don't mind me, you basically make in the springtime, at the beginning of the spring, your spice blend. And then whenever you're cooking, you just add in some of that. And why is this, a, why is this the spring blend and not the summer blend? It's very, very heating. Spring is when we want the most amount of heat. We want to burn off, cook off the heavy, cold stagnation of winter. Summer is warm and hot. How many people really feel like having spicy food in the summer? You just don't. You just naturally don't, right? Um, I was going to bring rosemary and basil are very heating spices. In the summer, we tend to want more spices like mint or cilantro, if we're going to have spices at all. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Any questions? Well, yeah. How do you distinguish? Yeah, which is such a great question, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But you, you're you from here, so I, I would just say that people like me who came here from, or Adele, and there was a group here before they came from Minnesota, and Adele's from Michigan and I'm from Chicago, I and mean, when you come from places like that where you have really distinct seasons, and almost I want to say extreme seasons, you know, <laughs> Chicago's like extreme <laughs> summer and extreme winter. Um, and then you move somewhere like Coronado, and it seems like it's just gorgeous all the time. But the longer you live here, the more you start to notice the subtleties. We get May gray, and we get a June gloom. And that is what? That's a fog. It's a little colder. It's a little heavier. It's a little wetter. So it does have some of the spring qualities to it. Right now, of course, it's very beautiful, but this morning it was gray until about noon. So, and that's going to increase <laughs> until about 4th of July. <laughs> when suddenly summer hits, <laughs> just in time for the crowds. <laughs> um, and then summer's pretty warm. Summer's pretty warm. And then we have summer, so it's a little bit off. It's not like September or suddenly summer's over. Um, I would say autumn starts here about in October, but uh, autumn is a drier season than the summer season. Summer is, we say summer is mostly warm, but we say it's it's, it's what we call pitta, and pitta is heat and fire with a little bit of water. You know, you notice you have a little bit of perspiration. 
But in autumn, we start to feel ourselves getting drier and drying out. And then, of course, winter is really not like Chicago. <laughs> and yet, we do find ourselves a little bit quieter. You know, we're not as out there as we are in the summer here. So it's subtler. It's, it's not as extreme. And yet, we also have San Diego foods. I think this is the interesting thing about San Diego is the food. Because here, we pretty much have food all year round, beautiful, fresh, gorgeous food. And yet, there's a distinction. There's a distinction between the foods that are coming up now in spring, which are he more heating and more astringent and drying, versus the ones that come in the summer, which are more your summer squashes, your zucchinis, really moist food with a lot of hydration to replace the, uh, the hydration that we're losing in the body. So it's subtle, but it's there. And so because it's subtle, we don't have to do as... It, it, it's all about balance in Ayurveda. Balance is the key word. Any living system, including the human body, brought into balance or homeostasis will automatically, naturally, and spontaneously heal itself. But balance is what is required for that to happen. So in Chicago, it may be that in the autumn, where it's really dry and the leaves are falling, it's getting windier, I really need more work on keeping my self balanced according to the seasons. And those distinctions, as we live the seasons in summer like Chicago, is going to be more profound. Whereas here, it's going to be subtle shifts. The other thing about San Diego that I've really noticed is the weather changes a lot, even though it seems like it's pretty much always, it used to always be like 70 and sunny, right? <laughs> but, you know, it's cold one day, we have a Santa and the next. And I notice people get sick a lot. It's that change. It's, it's not managing change well that causes sickness. People used to say to me, well, why if you don't wear a hat are you going to get sick? Sickness comes from germs. Not, but the truth is the body's immune system is weakened by those kinds of changes in temperature and changes in climate. Yeah, hi. There's a place for you right here if you want to come sit. Hi. Nice to see you. Any, any other question? Yeah. yeah. I love that. Um, growing up in San Diego, or living in San Diego, I've, I've been all over the place. So, <coughs> you know, the, the Orient yeah, and the you want to come around this way? Whatnot, all those seasons are altogether different. But now that I'm settled back in, in Coronado, yeah. um, in the San Diego area, <laughs> one of the foods that you grow up with and you get to like is it like Mexican food. Yeah. Or some ethnic food that you get used to and you really like. Uh, how, how is that? Um, how does that work with this system you're talking about? Thank you. Before everybody goes, I want to give you three takeaways. And so this is, gonna, this is the cue for me to do that. This is a great question. Did you hear the question? I'm going to say it back and you tell me if I got it right. He, he's traveled. What's your name again? John. John has traveled and lived around the world. Probably Navy? Marines. Sounds like Marines. OK, so is my brother in the Marines. So he's lived in lots of different places. And as you go to different places, like Japan, Mexico, et cetera, he's learned to like certain foods that are not our own ethnic foods but different ethnicities. And, that, and the question is, how does that fit? Yeah, how does, how do you, how does that work with the system now? Do you, do you have to knock all that off? OK. It? So it's a, it's the first thing I'd like to make just as a point about this. Japanese people are pitta, what we call pitta. So there's, Jennifer earlier was saying, there's five elements, and there's three doshas. And doshas are bioenergies. And everybody has all five elements, but we all have a unique combination of them. And that unique combination of them makes us tend to one or the other. So we tend to be more of an air person, more of a fire person, or more of a water person. And space and earth just kind of help support those things. So just think air, fire, water, they're the dynamic elements. And because they're dynamic, they tend to move out of balance. So Japanese people are fire people, for the most part. That's a, a pretty much of a pitta culture. And you just look at the history of Japan, it's very pitta. What is the Japanese food? It's the perfect pitta balancing diet. It's amazing. When you look at the ancient cultures, you will see that over time they have evolved through their own instincts, their own intuitions, through tasting food and seeing what it does to them. They've evolved the perfect diets for them. Mexico is a great example. Why is a hot country eating hot food? 
because Ayurveda is all about, before we even ask you what your dosha is, are your doshas in balance or not, we believe that if the digestive fire is good and strong, then you will have good immune system and you will have optimal health. So the first question we're asking is how well you're digesting and various questions around that. So in Mexico, where it's very, very hot, what happens to your digestion? Basically, the heat has to flee the center and it has to go to the edges of your system, to your skin, to be released, right? We perspire in order to release the heat from the body. And when we're perspiring, if you've ever had, I've had this experience where I was in the desert once and I couldn't eat. My digestive system just shut down. It was because I was too hot. And so the heat is going to the extremities, the, the outer body to try to release itself, and then it's not there to digest food. So what are you going to need? You're going to need to add to your food digestive spices to kindle your own digestive fire. Therefore, ironically, it seems strange, but hot countries eat hot food. South India, they eat really hot food. North India, it's not as hot in the mountains. Um, and that brings me to this, these three takeaways that I wanted to mention. There's three things that you can do for your health that you can just take with you tonight, even if you don't have the book, but they're also in the book. One is, how many of you love drinking iced water and beverages? Especially in the summer, yeah. So, ice, yeah. Until we, until you moved in, until you moved in behind us. <laughs> um, so, which, so we have to think about digestion as basically a fire, and if you put ice on a fire, you're going to put the fire out. Ice is something that you would put on inflammation, or you put it on a wound. You're trying to shunt the blood away. You want to get something to stop bleeding. You put ice on it. So is that what you want to do when you're trying to eat a meal? No, you want to bring blood to the digestive tract. And so ice or anything really cold is very unhelpful in terms of digestion. And one time you can get away with it. Once every season you can get away with it. But if you do that repeatedly, you will diminish your digestive fire. And you will notice that that's going to be affecting your health. So it's funny. Ayurveda has these funny little things. Like, How can that change my, what, how's that going to affect my health? But it will because it will diminish your digestion. And if you're not digesting well, we say you will get, end up with a buildup of ama, and ama is defined as undigested food particles. But the other definition is it becomes poison in your system. Your body doesn't know what to do with it, food that it can't digest, can't digest a lot of the new fangled foods that come out of factories and end up in our stores. It, your body doesn't know what that is, so it just says, I'll put this aside until I can figure out what to do with that. Uh, so one of the greatest things to do if a person wants to lose weight or they want to get healthy is to really build that digestive fire. And one of the things to do is then to avoid ice. Mm -hmm. And the other one really is very much about eating seasonally and also considering the season of your life. When we're young, we're in what we would, might call the spring season of our life. And when we get to about puberty until about 55 to 65, we're in what we call the fire, the pizza phase of life. We're out there and we're making things happen. And then this, the latter stage of our life is the air stage, where we become, you know, a little creaky. <laughs> <laughs> and then the final takeaway I wanted to give you, but I'll start with a question. What do you think is the number one thing you can do for optimal health? Number one thing you can do to improve your health? Number one, drink water, good one. Sleep, Sleep great one. Exercise. Exercise, of course, great one. Yeah. The most important thing you can do for your health is cook your meals at home because then you're controlling the ingredients you're making sure that you have fresh food that is seasonal and appropriate to your bioenergy and your balance and so really this book is an invitation to the medicine that is in your kitchen to the creativity that's in your own hands to the love that you're able to put in the food when you make it yourself and to that reconnection with nature on some level I think of it as a gentle revolution which is to really reclaim our health and to reclaim our connection to this world that we live in. Okay?